publications, volunteer opportunities, or just educating yourself, reading articles on racism and misogyny. I'll post a few links that have kind of resources for that stuff. So yeah, um, this event is not directly about, um, you know, this hate crime that happened, to, that happened Tuesday, um, but obviously all environmental issues uh, encompass racism and misogyny. Um, and so, you know, kind of with that transition, um, I'm, I'm going to talk about kind of more event stuff. Um, first, Monica Emery is going to talk for 20 minutes, have a little slideshow, then we'll have a Q&A afterwards. Um, during our Q&A, if you can, if you have questions, put your name in the chat. I'll call on you. We'll have kind of a sort of cue there. Um, you can also just type a question if you don't feel comfortable speaking out. Um, and so, yeah, I have an intro right here. Um, thank you for your patience. Um, I am thrilled to introduce our guest speaker, Monica Embry. Uh, she's an environmental activist and expert. Um, for the last 10 years, she's directed national energy campaigns at Greenpeace and now at the Sierra Club um, in these campaigns. She's advocated alongside several disadvantaged, di disadvantaged communities against fossil fuel giants. Um, and her latest work with the Sierra Club focuses on keeping oil and gas in the ground, including in Los Angeles. Um, Ms. Embry is also a Pomona alum and proud gra graduate of the Environmental Analysis Program. Um, and thank you so much for coming, Ms. Embry, and take it away. Great. Thanks again, everyone, um, for having me here. Really looking forward to this discussion uh, and conversation with you. Um, so I'm going to share my screen and do a slideshow and really excited about, um, yeah, the conversation that we're going to have uh, together. So today I'm going to talk um, about environmental justice and oil drilling in Los Angeles and actually across California. Um, before I begin, I want to do a quick introduction of who I am, because I always think you want to actually know uh, who is talking to you. Um, so as Jacob mentioned, my name is Monica Mariko Embry, um, and I am a third generation activist and organizer. Um, two of my parents, and both my parents and two of my grandparents were also community organizers on fighting for environmental justice, racial justice, immigrant rights, uh, and worker rights. My grandmother, her name was Sue Kunitomi Embry, and when she was 18 years old, she was incarcerated in a World War II concentration camp for people of Japanese ancestry called Manzanar. And uh, she spent over a year of her life locked up behind barbed wire where the machine guns faced in. And after leaving Manzanar, uh, she eventually did move back uh, to Los Angeles where uh, she was born um, and uh, started advocating for redress and reparations for the community. Because she knew it was wrong that she and our family and friends were uh, forced to pack everything they had to go to an unknown place for an unknown amount of time breaking their constitutional rights as US citizens because of wartime hysteria, racism, and xenophobia. Uh, these are very similar to the crisis that we are facing today. And I really wanna thank Jacob uh, for opening today, naming uh, the specific people whose names we know who were lost in the horrific violent crime um, that was perpetrated again because of xenophobia, racism, and sexism. Uh, and understanding the, the root causes of these crises is really important so that we're able to address them. We have a long history in this country um, of uh, violence against communities of color, including Asian American communities. And so my grandmother fought for many decades of her life to bring justice. Uh, and so she was advocating actively for um, Japanese Americans to get reparations uh, and to turn Manzanar actually into a national historic site run by our national park service. And after decades of advocacy, she won. And uh, in 1992, I was five years old and my grandmother successfully passed Manzanar uh, into becoming a national historic site. And the photo you see behind me is actually of uh, the monument and cemetery at Manzanar. And so she is uh, a large part of who I am. 
Uh, I did go to Pomona College um, and graduated in 2009 with my degree in environmental analysis, race, class, gender, and the environment. And it was during my first year at Pomona that my grandmother got sick. So she had this cough for as long as I could remember. And um, I would go visit her. I would take the train from Claremont out uh, to visit her in LA, uh, the Metrolink every weekend. Um, and she ended up getting sicker and sicker. And finally, uh, in my uh, freshman year, uh, finals week of the fall of the spring semester, um, I was in the hospital with her and she ended up passing away. And I wasn't sure what to do. I wasn't sure if I wanted to keep going to school at Pomona or what I wanted to study. Nothing seemed to make sense. Uh, and some of the people whose faces you see on the screen uh, were there to mentor me and support me and guide me through this and really helped me understand um, that I could study and learn what happened to my grandmother and then actually make a career out of making a difference in people's lives. And so um, Sefa, Char, and Phyllis uh, were professors and mentors of mine um, at my time at Pomona. Um, I worked at the Asian American Resource Center and uh, took classes with both Professor Miller and Professor Jackson um, really to uh, focus in on um, what was the cause of my grandmother's passing. What was it that actually was uh, the result of um, uh, her uh, cough and understanding the environmental injustice of how some communities are unduly exposed to more pollution helped me make sense of what had happened and what I needed to do to make a difference. So after graduating from Pomona, um, I've spent the last 15 years working as a professional environmental advocate with many organizations, some small, some global, um, uh, always really rooted in the causes of frontline community members. Um, I had an incredible opportunity to get published in uh, an anthology that Char Miller and Jeff Crane put together called A Nature of Hope that really talks about the work that I did in North Carolina uplifting a set of principles called the Hamez principles. And I'll talk about those a little later. Um, and today I continue to do that work and that advocacy here in California. And so thanks for letting me introduce myself, who I am and where I come from. I'm gonna spend uh, the next little bit talking about environmental justice and intersectionality to frame up how I think about the work that I currently do to help advocate uh, for justice and environmental justice specifically here in California and Los Angeles. So environmental justice and intersectionality. I first wanna talk about who I consider uh, and many consider the father of environmental justice. This is uh, Dr. Bob Bullard. He is a longtime uh, advocate and really has helped lead the charge on calling for environmental justice, which is a principle that embraces that all people and communities have a right to equal protection and equal enforcement of environmental laws and regulations. And Dr. Bullard has been leading this effort for many, many years uh, in the South, especially calling for environmental justice for those communities who have been on the front lines of environmental pollution. And the heart of environmental justice um, in part was uh, formed because of a response uh, in the 1980s, where we were seeing massive impacts of toxic pollution uh, coming to crisis. So there was uh, dioxin pollutions and spills in Love Canal, New York. You have Cancer Alley in Louisiana, where an entire region is named after the amount of cancer cases due to industrial pollution. And then a PCB uh, fight in Warren County, North Carolina really came to head where in the bottom right, you see community residents actively putting their bodies on the line where Warren County, an overwhelmingly African-American county in North Carolina was going to get all of the neighboring waste, that toxic PCB waste trucked in to their community and then contaminated their land, their water and their air and so activists literally put their bodies in the lines, as you can see, to try and stop those trucks. Ultimately, those activists in Warren County were unsuccessful. And that toxic landfill of PCB waste from predominantly white counties did get built there. But something else happened. They helped spark a movement. And so uh, a major report was published in 1987 on toxic waste and race. 
Um, and this report really looked at uh, the relationship and between where toxic facilities and toxic waste is and communities, especially communities of color. Uh, and this was one of the first reports ever to link environmental injustice and race explicitly. And this has now since been codified in our laws. Even the EPA has an agency, as an agency, has an environmental justice component, looking at the fair treatment and meaningful involvement of all people, regardless of race, color, national origin, or income, with respect to the development, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. And really, environmental justice is rooted in a theory of intersectionality. And some of you may be familiar with Kimberly Crenshaw. I learned about her first in a class by Professor Jackson, really looking at the complex and cumulative ways in which the effects of multiple forms of discrimination like racism, sexism, and classism overlap, intersect, and combine, and how those especially impact the experiences of marginalized individuals and groups. So it's not enough for us to look at the way that environmental pollution only impacts race, but also gender, also class, also nationality, disability, sexual orientation. What are the ways in which these various issues connect and combine to cause disparate harms on some communities over others? Which brings me to our current moment, uh, one of my favorite quotes by poet and activist Audre Lorde, there is no such thing as a single issue struggle because we do not live single issue lives. And so of course the lives that and experiences that we all have are directly connected, which is why today there's a growing understanding of intersectional environmentalism or environmental justice, which directly links environmental activism and social justice and looks at the intersects and overlaps of those struggles and movements. But it wasn't always that way. And it's important to understand the ways in which we haven't always had environmental justice be at the core of our work. I'm gonna talk about that specifically in relationship to the organization I work at today, which is the Sierra Club. So the Sierra Club was founded uh, by John Muir in the 1800s, specifically looking at um, the protection of beautiful places. Uh, this is a photograph of John Muir and uh, former president Teddy Roosevelt at Yosemite. And really these and other conservationists were the ones who helped spearhead the concept of protecting and natural places like Yosemite and helped form our national park system, um, which is really the legacy um, of the organization I work for. And part of that legacy includes the forced removal of the first peoples, the Native Americans who lived on that land to form national parks. And it's important to understand this history and how it currently uh, continues to impact the mainstream environmental movements advocacy and framing. So Muir and uh, Roosevelt and others considered parks without people, but that actually wasn't the first idea of the national parks. A painter named George Catlin in 1841 wrote that he thought the nation's parks could contain man and beast in all the wild and freshness of their nature's beauty. So Catlin, a painter, was actually envisioning places where people and wildlife peacefully coexisted and were able to be protected as Yosemite and many other places had been for time immemorial. Indigenous peoples have been living on these grounds, protecting them for decades, centuries, <laughs> millennia, right? And so here come John Muir and Roosevelt and others who actually have a very different perspective. And their perspective happened to be latent with racism rooted in white supremacy. So in 1888, John Muir wrote, somehow they, referring to Yosemite Valley's Mono Indians, seem to have no right place in the landscape. And I was glad to see them fading out of sight down the path. Muir continued to write extensively about the indigenous people he encountered while hiking and on nature trails. He described many as mostly ugly, some of them altogether hideous. He said, a strangely dirty and irregular life, these dark eyed, dark haired, half happy savages lead in this clean wilderness. Clean wilderness prescribed against the 
indigenous peoples who seem to have no right place in their own landscape, very different perception of a national park. And so it was this conception, a park devoid of people, removed of people. That's what Muir and others used to actually form our national park system. And so in thinking about this, many have written extensively about um, the racism and ethnic cleansing within the national park system and largely within the environmental movement's history. Uh, they were set to be described as, you know, creating wilderness for the worthy. And what does it mean for that to happen? when environmentalists and writers of this time period were convinced that people and nature were so separate and fundamentally incompatible. It's a very different view than intersectionality has. It's a very different view than environmental justice where people and nature are intricately linked. In fact, we are nature, right? We are part of our environment. Um, and really the this view from uh, Grant and Roosevelt and Muir and others um, was that wildlife was saving for its aristocratic qualities and where those were lacking, um, that wasn't worth saving, right? It was really about hunting and game. Uh, it was really about creating almost what's considered a playground for elite upper middle class white settlers to go enjoy with their families. Um, and that was a very different view um, of nature than uh, the first peoples the Native Americans had of the lands on which they were living and peacefully coexisting for centuries, thousands of years. So Sierra Club has been really grappling with this history as the environmental movement has as a whole. And July of last year, our executive director published a blog talking about pulling down our monuments. And we are really grappling with what does it mean that our founder was rooted in racism and white supremacy. Some of Muir's later writings did address this to some extent, but the point is that his work and legacy was really rooted in this concept. And we have to understand this history, to talk about this history, and to repair and redress this history. That's part of what my grandmother taught me. Harm happens, and the most important thing is not to ignore it, not to look the other way, but in fact, we must shine a light on the injustices that they happen and make sure we take adequate steps to repair and redress that harm. Whether it's a founder who is a white supremacist or a federal government that has unconstitutionally incarcerated your people, we need proper remediation for these harms. And so Sierra Club is recommitted to a set of principles that are called the Hamez principles. And these six principles were put together in 1996 by environmental justice advocates, uh, in part after years of asking the mainstream environmental movement to address the way they were showing up harmfully. And so they ask us to be inclusive, to emphasize bottom-up organizing, to make sure people are allowed to speak for themselves, to work together in solidarity and mutuality, to build just relationships among ourselves, and a commitment to self-transformation. And these principles are what guide my work and many other people's work today and are principles that we need to continue to actively commit to as one of the minor steps we need to take to repair some of the harm we've caused. So what does that look like in practice? Because that's a lot of history and theory, but thinking about what that looks like in our work is also really important. So quickly, I'm gonna cover California and LA oil drilling. So you may not know, but California, and this is a photograph from LA, is covered in oil and gas wells. California is actually number seven in the country for oil and gas production. And we produce over 161 million barrels of oil in 2019 from about 105,000 total active and idle oil wells. That is a photograph from Kern County a recent photograph that shows just how many oil wells we have. These oil wells are predominantly in Kern County, but a significant number are also here in LA and spread across Southern California and the Central Coast. The mapping of these oil wells, it's really important to understand uh, environmental justice within them, because it's not just that these oil wells cause significant harm, they cause different harm to specific communities and disproportionately communities of color and low income households. While about one in five Californians live within a mile of an oil and gas well, the majority of those who are negatively impacted include communities of color. 
And so we see that across Los Angeles, especially where we see high concentrations of the current oil wells in South Los Angeles in areas like Wilmington and Baldwin Hills in East Los Angeles, like Montebello, we see the disproportionate impact on communities of color. These are predominantly Latino and black communities in LA. Oil wells used to be all over um, and there are still some in Beverly Hills and some in upper middle class, predominantly white neighborhoods, but the majority of those have been capped and closed where the wells that remained in communities of color remain operating. So looking at LA County specifically, we've got over 5,000 oil wells actively drilling for oil right now or recently have drilled for oil and they cause massive health and environmental impacts. Our neighborhoods shouldn't kill us. The zip code that we're born into shouldn't determine our life expectancy or quality of life. And that is what's happening. In part because at every step in the oil production process, there are harms. Heavy truck traffic, bringing in toxic chemicals like fracking fluid and acid fluid and other chemicals to drill sites directly driving in our communities. Then those oil derricks and the drilling itself causes toxic emissions from the drilling processes. And those gases and liquids are stored on site and often leak, causing serious harms again to neighboring residents. We see oil wells near our homes, schools, parks, playgrounds, faith institutions, and healthcare facilities. The impacts range from nosebleeds and headaches, to eye and throat irritation, that cough my grandmother always had, and also more significant impacts like low birth weight babies and preterm births, asthma, cancer, and preterm death. These are all photographs of oil wells here in Los Angeles County. We see them directly next to our homes, our playgrounds, our schools, in farmland, even in the more rural parts of our county. And new research has linked COVID-19, both catching the disease as well as passing away from it, from high pollution rates. And so we know the disproportionate compounding impacts that communities of color are already facing with COVID-19, as well as from air pollution and how these are actually connected crises. So we have some solutions. We are actively calling for a just transition, which means leaving an extractive economy that's based on oil and gas and our military industrial complex with a concentration of wealth and power in the few, instead towards a regenerative economy, one funded and energized by clean energy that's resilient with affordable homes and jobs for all people. We know that this is possible. It is really a question of power, not technology. So we have three strong things that we work here on California. We call them stop, drop, and roll. We want to stop all new permits from being passed, continue to phase out existing oil and gas production, and take the first immediate step of rolling out a 2,500 foot setback distance as the minimum distance between oil wells and our communities to protect those who are the most vulnerable from the highest risks. So we are doing that in two main policies. At the state level, we advance that. Um, there's an agency called CalGEM who helps actually write rules around oil and gas. And we are actively working right now to get them to pass a rule. It's expected to come out in April and we've been fighting and pushing hard for that 2,500 foot setback in that rule. And then also here in LA County where we have the Board of Supervisors who are actively working right now to update their oil and gas rule. And we are similarly calling for proper setbacks and a phase out of oil and gas production here in Los Angeles. And so how do we do this? Uh, I'm gonna go through this real quick and this is my ending here is on volunteer leadership and organizing from the bottom up as you heard is a key commitment from the Hamed's principles. So what do we do to actually help pass those laws and regulations to get the solutions we need? We organize our communities. Pre-COVID time, we went door to door and talked to neighbors and residents, have them sign petitions and get involved. We testify at hearings. This morning I was testifying at an LA city meeting. This is an older photograph of us when we were back in person testifying at Culver City and this works. 
In Culver City, we've gotten that city council to successfully commit to shut down their oil drilling sites because of the people that you see in this photograph and years of advocacy. We lobby our elected officials. This is us with a photograph of then Senator, now current supervisor, uh, Holly Mitchell, calling on her to lead important legislation and rules. We rally for justice, sometimes with cool people like celebrities like Don Cheadle, definitely taking to the streets and making sure we make our voices heard. This is from the People's Climate March last uh, two years ago. And we build with others. Sierra Club could never do this alone. We build strongly partnerships, especially with those groups that represent people on the front line here in Los Angeles. That includes Stand LA. And we take people on toxic tours and outings. Again, pre-pandemic and hopefully once we're safe to meet again in person, we take people on hikes and explain the impacts and talk about what's going on in our neighborhoods so people have an understanding as they're hiking of what's also happening. We make art and do creative resistance. You see two of our youngest volunteers there wearing t-shirts that we made with boxes full of thousands of petitions that we delivered to LA County calling for common health and safety protections. And we educate online, of course, right now with COVID, uh, doing lots of social media work and in the news. We made this video and supported this work of, with allies uh, in the New York Times, we get in the LA Times and make sure to tell our story loud so everyone can hear what we're talking about. And I wouldn't be an organizer if I didn't end asking you to take action. So I'm asking you to join us in this effort because quite simply, this is not okay. Having oil wells this close to our schools and homes is unacceptable. It's the leading cause of climate change and a main contributor to local air pollution and many different health impacts. So please join us. You can sign our petition by going to sc.org slash LA oil and join with hundreds of others calling on our LA County to protect people and not polluters. Find out more on our social media pages and online. We've got blogs and resources where you can learn all of this and I'll make sure to the, share the slide deck afterwards. And of course, you can always also get in touch with me. And I'll end with my favorite quote, which is that if you have come to help me, you are wasting your time. But if you have come because your liberation is bound up with mine, then let us work together. Thank you. Awesome, that was so great. If you guys can just, I don't know, put a little clap emoji or clap out loud. Um, yeah, thank you so much, um, Ms. Embry. Um, and now we'll just do a few questions. Um, so if you have a question, you can just put your name in the chat. Um, I'll call on you so we kind of have a cue um, or you can type it in the chat. Um, yeah, I don't know if anyone wants to start. I guess I can go ahead. I already have one. Um, just let people think um, about any questions they have. Um, I was wondering, you mentioned the history of um, native displacement that the Sierra Club has um, kind of um, enabled almost a little bit. Um, and I was wondering how um, in some of your projects now, you're also um, kind of trying to uh, respect tribal land and tribal sovereignty um, especially like I know there's some renewable projects in like the Mojave and a lot of deserts in South Southern California that may infringe upon that. Thank you. That's a great question. Um, so we are really committed to rebuilding just relationships as one of the Hamez principles calls us to do with tribal partners and treating uh, tribal organizations, tribals as tribes, as nations, sovereign nations with which we want to make sure have adequate um, accessibility and responsibility to the lands. Um, and so often this manifests in a couple of different ways. I can share a couple of examples. Um, here locally, uh, I've worked uh, with Julia Bogany, who folks may know has an office in Claremont. Um, and actually, as we embarked on our campaign locally on one of the oil fields, we asked the Tongva people's permission to engage on that campaign which is a pretty different framing, even asking permission to be able to do work uh, on lands, right? 
Often we start meetings um, with land acknowledgements and ask that many of our members and supporters think about and learn about the people whose lands we are on, not as people who are no longer living, but those who are actively still here and part of our communities and that the lands we are on are unseated um, and occupied. We've done some work at the federal level um, quite a bit on this. Um, in part, most recently, I'm thrilled uh, that Secretary Holland has now been affirmed into her role. We did quite a lot of work to help work and move that forward. But we also have worked to help sponsor legislation federally. Um, and so in Congress, uh, we helped pass legislation to protect native sites. One I've specifically worked on in New Mexico is the Greater Chaco landscape. Um, which is also being dramatically infringed upon by oil and gas wells and oil and gas industry was trying to continue to expand their destructive practices on uh, and in the lands around Greater Chaco, um, which is incredibly sacred grounds to dozens of different tribes. Um, and so we worked really closely with uh, Pueblo and many other nations um, to make sure that we are actively partnering with them in that advocacy and actually helped uh, fly out. I flew out to Washington, D.C. with representatives from multiple tribes to lobby in support of that legislation. Um, we've done a lot of partnership also with communities in uh, the Arctic and specifically in Alaska around oil and gas drilling and really uplift the voices of the Gwich'in and other tribes who are leading the fights there. So sometimes it looks like um, providing resources, like the funding to fly people to DC. Sometimes it looks like asking permission. Sometimes it looks like partnering. Sometimes it looks like following the guidance and leadership. Um, and I will say all of that is insufficient. We must do much, much more to be truly just and equitable partners um, with the First Nations of this country. Awesome. Um, Hina, do you wanna go? Do you have a question? Yes. Um, can you all hear me? Well, okay, that's good. Um, <laughs> thank you so much, Ms. Emory, for coming to talk to us. Um, the, sh uh, the stories you shared were incredible and I learned a lot. Um, I was actually interested in the work that Sierra Club and advocacy works on the state level. Um, I imagine that passing legislative, like legislators is definitely a tough process. And I was wondering what the time frame looked like, how long it would take um, for um, legislators to really start taking action um, from when advocacy activities like begin, if that makes sense. Absolutely. Now that's a great question. Um, so yeah, legislation at the state level is complicated and hard. You are right. Um, in California, we have two year legislative cycles. So this year we just begun a new process. And so this year um, up until uh, last month, we were having new bills introduced. So our senators and our assembly members will introduce a bill uh, and Sierra Club and many other groups work with those senators and assembly members to work on the policy of what bills we think need to move forward. One of the bills I'm super excited about this year is called SB 467. And that is a bill to ban dangerous drilling. And it has two actually three significant components. The first thing this bill does is it bans fracking and other types of dangerous drilling. So most people have heard about fracking as a really dangerous extractive practice. In California, we actually have four different types, just very similar to fracking, but they're called other complicated things like acidizing, where instead of fracking fluid, we pump acid underground to drill for oil. We also use processes called steam and water flooding, where we put high pressure or low pressure steam and water laced with chemicals underground. Uh, very similar processes to fracking, but technically different. So we need to make sure we wrote into the legislation that all of those dangerous practices get banned. And we worked um, with senators to put that language in. The other two big pieces of this bill is that it institutes that 2,500 foot setback I was talking about. So it's calling for that setback to be implemented and no new will, wells could be drilled and that existing wells, all of their new permits would also be denied. So eventually it would actually phase out wells within that distance. 
The third thing that Bell does, which we're looking for the final language on, is to help put workers who've been laid off, fossil fuel workers who've been laid off, to work cleaning up the toxic infrastructure. People within the fossil fuel industry already have the training and skills and resources, and they need to be put to work to help actually clean up the toxic sites so that we can redevelop them with our tribal partners helping lead what that redevelopment should look like. Um, so you're, that was the bill. How long does it take to have a bill like that pass, right? So we uh, had that bill introduced. It was introduced by Senators uh, Wiener and Senators Limon. The first thing we did was we actually had Sierra Club and our allies, including frontline environmental justice leaders from the Central Valley, like Kern County, uh, and the Central Coast, speak at a press conference. So we spoke at a press conference with the senators live on Zoom uh, and announced the bill. The next step that happens is the bill goes through a committee. And so we have a committee vote coming up on April 13th. And we are going to be right now, we are calling and writing to the senators on that committee, asking them to support the bill. After the bill passes its first committee, it goes to another committee where we do the same process. And then finally, it'll go to the entire Senate and gets voted on by the entire Senate. That process can happen from now through September. So the first committee vote is in April. Another one could be later in April, could be later, depends on when they schedule those. And then it goes to the whole Senate. After it passes the Senate, the same exact bill has to go to the assembly and go through the same process through a committee and then passed by the entire floor. So that is why we usually have a two year process for bills in California. And so then that bill would go through the assembly. And after that happens, it goes to the governor to get signed. So we're really hopeful that this bill will move through those committees uh, this year um, and hopeful that within the two year window, so this year, next year, we'll actually pass it and get it to the governor's desk. That's the kind of timeline that we work for on state advocacy for state legislation. Thank you so much for sharing. Dave, go ahead. Hi, Monica. First of all, thank you so much for your time and for being with us this afternoon. Um, I wanted to ask about um, sort of your experience, especially um, in organizing in California, which is typically viewed by the rest of the country as an extremely progressive place comparatively, um, and, and maybe the kind of resistance you've encountered from um, elected officials and, and, and folks um, uh, on, on the uh, Democratic side of the aisle, especially the Newsom administration, who might be viewed as more open to these um, really necessary improvements, but who sometimes might move a little slowly. I would love to hear about sort of that experience as well. Absolutely, and you named it well. Um, yeah, so people often think that California is full of environmentalists and progressive minded people, and therefore we don't need to pass any laws, right? We're leading the charge. We heard that a lot. Um, and while it's true that in some areas we're leading the charge, we're actually really falling behind on oil and gas. And so uh, that is part of why Sierra Club is really invested into making sure we address supply side, as it's called, uh, camp climate issues. Because if we don't address the supply side, we actually don't meet climate justice. Um, so to make it really clear, often sometimes the pushback I get from our elected officials is, no, we, no, 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 we just have to stop demand. We just have to stop cars and buildings and other things from burning fossil fuels. And then the supply will take care of itself. Unfortunately, that's not how it works. Uh, that's way oversimplification of how demand and supply actually works in the marketplace. But furthermore, we know that we actually have to stop producing and stop drilling all of our oil and gas here in California. And that's in part because of brilliant reports that have come out of the UN, um, including there's a specific report that looks at California's oil and gas drilling as one of the main barriers to meeting our own state's climate goals. If we don't adequately start slowing down and doing what we call a managed decline of oil and gas, we will not meet or beat the goals that we need to. California is actually really behind states like Texas, and Colorado have statewide setbacks. Actually, it's about a dozen oil and gas states have statewide setbacks between oil wells and communities and California does not. 
Colorado passed theirs last year, it is a 2000 foot setback. Right? So we are calling for 2,500 feet because that's what the science says was the minimum setback distance to start alleviating some of these environmental harms and environmental pollution. The health impacts from oil drilling happens miles from the site. So 2,500 feet is not fully protective. We think it's the bare minimum that the state needs to do. So we have been meeting with the Newsom administration and his regulators. Um, that agency is called CalGEM, is the state agency that writes the oil and gas rules, really providing the science and backing, but also the political push, right? We know the science is on our side, that we have to stop oil and gas drilling to protect our health, to protect our environment, to protect our climate. It's a political question. And so we are often up against the largest companies in the world who are putting in millions of dollars to lobby our governor and our legislators. The oil and gas industry and their friends have put in millions and millions of dollars. And so Sierra Club has actually published a report and we're gonna to continue to publish it quarterly that shows how much fossil fuel money our state government has accepted in terms of lobbying and advocacy. And so that's a that money, that dirty money report is one that Sierra Club is actually putting forward to try and hold our oil and gas legislators and administrators and regulators accountable to the people that they represent and not fossil fuel interests. The main opposition we face is, or the main argument in terms of the opposition we face is around jobs. And so when you saw a solution that we are calling for is around just transition right? The reason for that is absolutely we need to reconfigure our entire economy to not be an extractive fossil fuel economy and instead be a regenerative renewable energy fueled economy. And we know that we can do that. We also know there are more people today working in renewables than in oil and gas. And so we actually are putting more people to work in healthier jobs. And we want those jobs to be good jobs. They should be high road jobs with family sustaining wages so people can take care of their families. Sierra Club is proud to be a union organization. Our staff are unionized and we partner with labor unions. We want union jobs for our communities and we are gonna keep fighting for those as we transition. It's not going to be overnight. We do need to end drilling as fast as we possibly can. And we understand that we're not gonna shut down all of our wells tomorrow but we need to figure out the plan to get there as fast as we possibly can. And that is what we are advocating for. Any more questions? I have a question, if that's okay. Of course, please I, go ahead. How many people knew that we drilled for oil in LA and in California? Some folks, okay. Looks like about half kind of knew and half didn't, yep. That's always part of what's really interesting to me is to know that these are all over and um, sometimes they're hidden. So sometimes oil wells are actually hidden behind buildings. They will build a wall around them so that communities don't know. Those buildings don't have roofs, so the emissions still go straight out, um, but literally they'll hide them. Uh, so I have photos that are really amazing to see. That usually only happens in upper middle class areas like Beverly Hills, in Wilmington, in Baldwin Hills, in Montebello, right in East LA, in South LA, they are right in neighborhoods right in our backyards. Uh, and so people, uh, the way environmental racism and environmental injustice unfolds and even who gets to see the oil well in their backyard um, is really telling. So thanks for sharing that with me. I always wanna know how many people knew that this is happening. I can share also, there's a really great map where you can enter in any address and find out how close you live to an oil and gas well in California and how old that well is. Uh, so you can actually learn how close are you uh, and your communities um, to oil and gas drilling. Remember, there's 105,000 oil and gas wells. So there's a good chance here in Southern California and the Central Valley and Central Coast, you live pretty close to an oil well. 
I guess I also have one more question. Um, just what do you think you've kind of learned about um, environmental activism or activism more generally um, since kind of going to Pomona College and um, going, to, yeah, going to the Sierra Club? That's a great question. Um, I learned a lot at Pomona. Um, I mean, those professors and mentors that I named, I could have added hundreds of more to that slide. I feel like there were so many people and not just the professors and staff, but also my peers. Um, so I was in the first class that had the EA track race, class, gender, and the environment. So that we were the first group to actually have the intersectionality and environmental justice approach uh, within EA. And even what it was called back then, right? It was called, it wasn't called environmental justice. It was called EA, race, class, gender, and the environment, right? And that was the framing has changed so much since uh, I graduated, um, you know? And so thinking about um, how much the movement grows and continues to grow, it's not um, only something that's in a textbook. Um, but I learned so much. I took many brilliant classes. Um, there's a Pitzer professor, Brenda Serafi, who has a great environmental justice 101 class, at least she did 15 years ago, um, <laughs> that I really recommend. Um, you know, Professor Phyllis Jackson's classes on unpacking white supremacy um, and whiteness and really understanding their art history classes. And those were some of the foundations of how I began to understand the conception of race and intersectionality, which were pivotal. Those weren't a requirement for my EA degree, and I think should be a requirement, actually. Thinking about the ways in which we really link uh, the ethnic studies and gender women's studies classes I took taught me so much about movements across our history and across country and place, across the world even, to know how people have stood up against oppression and racism and sexism and environmental racism and environmental sexism, right? Part of what I talk about is the ways that this impacts health, it impacts women's health, it impacts babies, right? Mothers are often those who are getting disproportionately impacted and passing it on to the next generation. The way that gender and race and class all really intersect at the same time. Pomona taught me that. Um, it was actually really interesting when I left Pomona uh, was part of when I realized how siloed the movement can be. And some organizations look at environments over here and social justice over here, and they're not together. I'm really glad that the movement is shifting to really understand how deeply interconnected they are and not opposing forces. I've even met people after graduating who thought environmentalists shouldn't be social justice advocates and social justice people who didn't care about the environment. And those are really changing right now. And I'm, I, I credit environmental justice theorists like <laughs> Dr. Bullard and uh, Dorsita Taylor and so many others who've done so much work to draw the connections. Um, and I think the biggest thing I've learned since leaving Pomona and doing this work is actually around what Dave was asking of like how hard it is. You have all the facts, you have all the research, you have all the science and it's about power. Policies and politics is all about power. And so how do we build power? We build power with our people. I am never going to out fund Shell or Exxon or BP as they fight me in these policies. It's not possible. So I'm not going to be able to run more ads or buy more politicians election campaigns than they are, but I will be able to touch more people and engage more communities and connect with more coalitions than they can. And so when we all come together and actually, you know, the truth of people power is bringing communities together. And when we do that in a way that's rooted in equity and justice, that's rooted in those frontline voices, being the ones who get to decide and lead the charge, that's when we win. And that's how we pass policies. And so I can actually share, which I didn't share earlier, we won our vote this morning. So at LA City Council, <laughs> environmental justice and environmental groups came together, proposed an amendment, and it was passed unanimously, right? And so it works. How did we do that? First, we came together with the different groups to come up with an idea of where the current motion was lacking and what we wanted added to it. 
We had a lot of meetings and discussions. We wrote it out in a letter. We all together sent in that letter to the city council, submitted that officially yesterday, and then had dozens of volunteers write to their council members and call their council members, asking them to take this stance. We met with the council members. And then today we had over uh, a dozen people call in to the hearing and it, they discussed it and passed it unanimously. And that's one committee. Like I said, remember laws go through a committee, sometimes multiple committees and then the whole body, right? So same at the state level, at the local level. So that passed through one LA city committee with five, but it passed unanimously. It's gonna go to a next committee with three votes and then the whole council. And we're pretty excited, right? We think we're gonna pass it at that 15 person council. We've already got five yeses. We think we're gonna get to what we need to pass it to the 15, right? And so that's really exciting. So today we helped pass a new law. And what that law, well, we've tried the first step to passing that new law. We still gotta get there. But what that law will do is actually hold oil and gas companies accountable to pay for the cleanup for the oil wells and also fund some of the response from just transition, including the health and environmental impacts in frontline communities, especially communities of color. So we just passed a, a motion that said the oil and gas industry should pay for their damages. Polluters should pay, not people. And that's a really big deal. And the fact that we are helping pass a motion to look at actually holding them financially responsible is part of what we need also to move this forward. So, so we can win, right? We got Culver City to shut down their drilling. We passed this motion in LA City. We're gonna keep pushing to end all drilling in LA City and LA County and make sure we get that statewide setback to protect our most vulnerable communities. We can win, it'll take a long time. But my grandma fought for 45 years, right? She was incarcerated and then started organizing in 1969 and Manzanar became a site in 1992. Sometimes it takes decades to win. Our communities don't have decades. We shouldn't wait decades, but we will keep fighting for as long as it takes to make sure that we win. Unless there are any more questions, I think that is a great place to wrap it up. Um, just again, thank you all for coming. Thank you so much. Um, Monica and Bree, that was amazing. Um, and yeah, I, I think the only other thing is if you can send me that map, um, I'll put the kind of map of where the oil wells are, um, as well as the kind of um, last slide petition that you included in the Facebook um, event. So if you guys want to go to the Facebook event, you can fill out the petition, you can look at where your house is. Um, I think that would be great. Um, and then just one last thing, um, Dave um, is actually having a wonderful event um, this Saturday at 12, I think. Um, it's about Black leadership organizing um, in New Georgia um, with Reverend Denise Freedom. Um, so I really recommend you also go to the, that event. Um, and yeah, I, I'll be there. Um, hopefully I can see some of you there too. Um, but again, thank you so much, um, Assembly, and yeah. I will close this event now. Thank you so much for having me. I love having spaces in these conversations, um, especially at my alma mater, but with anyone. And so thank you, thank you. Um, I'll definitely send you my whole slide deck. Folks can use it. And my contact info is on there. Feel free to reach out, email, text. I'm on Instagram and Twitter. Uh, feel free to reach out. I love connecting with people um, about this and happy to be in community. Um, this is how I got to be where I was, as people, alumni, and others reached out and happy to talk to you if you want to get more involved in environmental justice here in Southern California or across California. Happy to think about um, what that partnership can look like. So please reach out. I'm here and want to be available and connect with you all. So thank you. Thank you so much for making time today. Thank you. All right. Bye all. Thank you so much. Thank you.